Hi everyone, Nemo here. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I've mentioned this before, and to prove it, here's my temple recommend. But, this got me thinking. What would it be like for someone who has never been a member of the church to take a temple recommend interview? Well, I know someone who's never been a member of the, temple, of, a member of the church, and uh, I've got them here with me. So I'm going to introduce you to Lewis from Numinosophy Academy. Right. Hello, everyone. Good to be with you all. Uh, I'm used to, at this point, saying welcome to Numinosophy Academy. I'm Lewis, but of course, we're not on Numinosophy Academy uh, this evening, or this evening for us, I should say. Um, but it's good to be here with uh, with Nemo on uh, his channel. Um, so I just thought I would say a couple of things about um, the questions and the way I'm going to try and discuss the questions. Um, of course, you know, not being a Mormon, I can't really just answer the questions because I'm not, you know, operating from within the same uh, framework. I'm not, you know, operating within the Mormon worldview. And so because of that, I'm going to be more kind of, um, we're going to be talking around the questions um, a bit more. Um, just as an aside, you know, I think uh, just to do a little bit of epistemology uh, quickly, you know, how do we know what we know? Um, I tend to think that when it comes to um, kinds of knowing, uh, there are kind of two kinds of knowing. There's the kind of um, external or kind of uh, propositional uh, kind of knowing. And then there's a kind of intuited and interior kind of knowing. And the temple recommend questions operate at that kind of more surface level. Something either is or it's not. You either believe it or you don't. Um, and so, you know, they're a little bit more kind of uh, two-dimensional in that way. Uh, and so to get to kind of the deeper level, you need to kind of, I don't know, get past the words in a way, or, you know, get to the um, intuited knowledge which uh, lies between the words. So hopefully, you know, we can get there by kind of uh, talking around uh, the questions a little bit. And you have gone silent, Nima. I have <laughs> muted myself. There we go. Uh, so I just want to confirm that I'm not a bishop in the church. Um, I uh, have no authority to give Lewis a temple recommend, even if I wanted to. Um, but with that said, Lewis, would you like to crack on with the first question? Absolutely. Go for it. Brilliant. So the first question of the temple recommend interview questions, which are in the description, should you want to read along or check them out yourself? Uh, the first question is, do you have faith in and a testimony of God, the Eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost? So, <clears throat> of course, you know, thinking about these this question from a kind of um, Orthodox Christian vantage, uh, you get the you get the questions around Trinitarian theology versus mm -hmm. um, the way that um, Mormons think about um, the Trinity, and I guess that is something more akin to a little team or a little club um, mm -hmm. of three people all working in accord, um, rather than the whole three in in one uh, type idea. Yeah. Um, so I, I find it amusing that uh, in the specific wording, uh, you know, a comma is not enough. Uh, <laughs> To uh, to divide the uh, the three members of the Trinity, only the sem semicolon uh, is sufficient <laughs> in uh, in keeping them sufficiently apart. Uh, so that's my first observation, and then my second one is the use of the word eternal when talking about the Father. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, kind of within um, you know conservative religiosity where the line is drawn between uh, something being understood in kind of metaphorical terms and something being understood in literal terms. And of yeah. course, Mormonism being more conservative does tend towards um, understanding things in, in very literal terms, yeah. um, but not here, not when it comes to the use of the word eternal. No. Um, okay. Because, uh, you know, God the Father had 
a mortal existence once upon a time. Am I right in thinking that? Uh, yes, it's the Joseph Smith quote, um, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. Um, so there's that idea that God was once just like us. So yeah, in that sense, he's not eternal. Um, so he, he earned his eternity, which is... It, uh, essentially. There which is... That, yeah. Is a weird is a weird thing because that you know mm. kind of works in reverse somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I guess uh, does the word testimony mean anything to you? I mean, from a Mormon's perspective, that has quite a clear connotation. That word testimony, in terms of uh, for you, what does that what does that bring up? Um, yes, I mean it, it's obviously used um, as a language device within Mormonism. That's not, mm. and it's you know that's unlike any other denomination you know mormons obviously talk about my testimony is yes um yeah. and that being them kind of declaring their truth i suppose mm -hmm. um i see it as so, like witnessing amongst other christians is that similar sort of vibe yeah like, yeah yeah absolutely um so yeah, that's as close as I'm going to get to actually giving you okay. an actual answer, though. Yeah, no worries. I can read you the <laughs> church's definition if you'd like. Yeah, go uh, for it. It go. says a testimony is a spiritual witness given by the Holy Ghost. So they're asking, do you have faith? So faith, a, a belief in something um, which you cannot prove, but you wish to be true, and that you you have a of a, a desire to be true, and you therefore make decisions as though it's true. Um, but then do you have a testimony of these things as well? Do you have a spiritual witness given to you by the Holy Ghost? So it's not just enough to have faith to answer this question. You you have to have a testimony as well. You yeah. have to have had the Holy Ghost tell you it's true. So what happens to members who haven't had that experience? Yeah, and I think I've heard that um, lots of Mormons talk about the kind of warm, fuzzy feeling mm -hmm. type sensation. So yeah. they read the Book of Mormon Mm. and it brings them kind of interior comfort in some yeah. way and so that acts for them as their affirmation that, yes. that it is yeah. that it is true mm. um and yeah i think um you know in a way i don't have a problem with that if i put on my kind of what it might be like um to to mm -hmm. think um as a mormon hat then um yeah i i i don't see this question as being really that that problematic really uh you know it, it perfectly fits into um the way the trinitarian model is understood within mormonism mm -hmm. today which is of course you know not to negate the fact that that over the course of joseph smith's life his own yep. understanding about the trinity of course evolved indeed um, because the book yeah, of i've mormon, talked about that to death <laughs> yeah the book of mormon it obviously suggests something more akin to orthodox mm-hmm Trinitarian at least theology. in its 1830 edition it did and then kind of yeah. just did a little bit of redacting and reducing and changing yeah um, which is, which right. is kind of which is a little bit surprising yeah um, if, given that his yeah. father uh, was more unitarian uh, mm -hmm. in, his, in his thinking so it's surprising that that his father's ideas were kind of rejected initially but then kind of came back mm -hmm. in by the back door a little bit yeah I, I think it was almost a need for mormonism to be a bit more unique in, in some ways to be a bit more spectacular to kind of build the thing to, to allow people to continue to follow it. Yeah. Um, the second question is on a very kind of similar vein, actually. It's again, another, do you have a testimony of question? It is, do you have a testimony of the atonement of Jesus Christ and of his role as your savior and redeemer? What do you think to that? So, I mean, that sounds, you know, very Christian, really. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, there's anything in that language um, that, yeah, flies in the face of, of Orthodox Christian understanding, you know, that you have a faith that Jesus um, in some sense died for, for you or died to atone for sin or, or something like mm -hmm. that, uh, depending on kind of what theological model you, you kind of understand that through. Um, so, yeah, I, I think anyone that, is kind of broadly within the Christian arena in as far as we can understand Mormonism as being within that Christian mm -hmm. arena. I, I don't see it as very problematic. So yeah, sure. I, th I think that's one of the most kind of um, banal questions yeah. of the entire thing. It's it's very similar to, uh, and I can't remember which church does it, but they effectively have the, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior? The idea that you've accepted Christ. Um, so that's basically, it's a very similar question. Do you, 
you know, have you had warm fuzzies about the fact that Christ is your savior and redeemer? Yeah, I guess the only, my only question mark would be, of course, there's been the whole kind of attempts um, in, in the last few decades to make Mormonism appear more mainstream Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that has left a lot of Mormons kind of wondering to, to what extent they should put emphasis on um, the narrative surrounding Jesus as it appears in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And I think there, I, I've read, a, you know, a lot of people that do have conflicts around that idea, you yeah. know, in some sense, you just have to have faith in Jesus and that should resolve everything. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, within Mormonism, it doesn't resolve everything. So, no. you know, so it puts you in a complicated uh, <laughs> position. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, and, and, and what they do then is they, they kind of, they've, they've laid these first two questions and then almost as a third one, they get openly Latter-day Saint specific, you know, putting to one side the issues around the Trinity and whatever, they start to get very specific to the RDS church. They, the third question is, do you have a testimony of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So all of a sudden it's about, okay, you've got a, a testimony of uh, the Godhead or the Trinity. You know, you could look at it either way. If you like, we're not really too first. Um, there's nothing there to say you have to believe in them as separate beings. Then you've got that very nice question about Christ. Do you accept his atonement or do you have a testimony of it and do you see him as your savior and redeemer? And then they're like, and do you feel the same way about the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Joseph Smith stuff? That's that's then all of a sudden they're like, right, yeah, but do you put this in the same category as those? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, it's obviously an incredibly loaded question um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of stuff that's underpinning that. You know, yeah. that to believe in the restoration um, obviously has the all the Mormon theological ideas about that there was this decline um, that mm -hmm. took place uh, soon after soon after Jesus did whatever he did, went to America, mm -hmm. um, and and then Joseph Smith was able to, you know, restore the true church um, yeah. on earth. Um, so again, you know putting my Mormon hat on, if you if you do have a testimony in in the truth of the Book of Mormon, then that obviously comes via Joseph Smith. And so um, thinking in those terms, you're not going to get to this point and, and have a problem with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, sure. Yeah. I think I think these up. first three questions almost <laughs> act to kind of vet people, don't they? They're, they're, they're almost like, right, okay. Uh, you're, you're, you're in the Christian group. Okay. You're in the believing Christ is helping you out group. Now are you in the group that believe that everyone else got it wrong and now we're right? It's like, we're, we're narrowing in the Venn diagram with these questions. Um, and then, uh, the fourth one is an absolute doozy. And I feel like we're going to start to spend more time on questions as we, we go on. Um, the fourth question is a bit of a long one as well. So feel free to ask me to repeat any parts of it that you like. It is, um, do you sustain the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the prophet, seer, and revelator, and as the only person on the earth authorized to exercise all priesthood keys? Do you sustain the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators? Do you sustain the other general authorities and local leaders of the Church? So, yeah, I mean, the, so the key word, I think, is obviously sustain. Um, what does it mean to sustain um, the the leaders of your church? Because, you know, if you look at the definition of sustain, um, that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't imply full accord with or full agreement with even. You know, you can, you can sustain someone, but disagree with them. You could, you could want the very best for someone but disagree with them um but of course that is not the way this is <laughs> this is understood um this is obviously understood in terms of you will agree with every utterance um in the way that you know teachings of the church are are, are articulated um yeah. and and there's definitely a kind of um almost corporate um tone to it in a way it's like you know the the hierarchy will be honored you know the people at the top of this pyramid you know will be 
um, respected and, and understood as the authorities that they are. They will not be questioned even. Um, and, you know, that's very, it's very scary in a way for a religion mm. to frame itself in such a way that, you know, the leaders are beyond reproach. The leaders are beyond questioning yeah. um, because, you know, obviously a, a healthy um, dialogue or a healthy um, context in which um, religiosity can be explored is one in which you can push back to some degree against those that are trying to, to teach you and to lead you. Um, and to say, you know, I, I don't quite understand why you've arrived at this. Can you explain to me um, the kind of chain of, of uh, thinking that's got you to this point? Yeah. Um, but of course, the church doesn't really want to answer questions in that no. way. <laughs> no, I mean, if we look at, uh, I've pulled up a couple of quotes here. If we look at uh, what's this, uh, what the sustaining means, um, we have to look at Elder Iring's talk from the 2019 April conference, uh, The Power of Sustaining Faith, when he said, you can withhold your sustaining vote or you can pledge your sustaining faith. By raising your hand to sustain, you make a promise. You make a promise with God whose servants these are, that you will sustain them. These are imperfect human beings, as are you. Keeping your promises will take unshakable faith that the Lord called them. Keeping those promises will also bring eternal happiness. Not keeping them will bring sorrow to you and those you love, and even losses beyond your power to imagine. Now, if that's not a threat, that if you don't sustain your leaders, bad stuff's going to happen, I don't know what is. And it was never understood to me uh, like that. But um, I would I would always think that sustaining meant I would support and help my leaders, particularly because this question, if you go back to the end of the question, it says, do you sustain the other general authorities and local leaders of the church? In this interview, you're sat across from a local leader of the church. Yeah. So yeah. He, he, you're effectively being asked, do you sustain me? Do yeah. you, are you going to support me? That's what it always felt like. But now, Elder Iring has said that, you know, um, bad stuff's going to happen if you don't sustain these leaders, if you don't do what they say. Yeah. The fiery pits of Mordor await you. Exactly. If you do not, Essentially. If you do not toe yeah. the line. Mm. Yeah. I mean, uh, and also, I suppose the phrase priesthood keys would be a little bit um, alien to you. Did, did you want me to, to cover that? Uh, yeah, sure. Go that for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so the, the, from the church's website, it says the keys of the priesthood are the rights of presidency or the power God gives to man to govern and direct the kingdom of God on the earth. Priesthood keys are necessary to direct the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the ordinances of salvation. Jesus Christ holds all the keys of the priesthood pertaining to his church. He has conferred upon each of his apostles all the keys that pertain to the kingdom of God on earth. The president of the church is the only person authorized to exercise all of those priesthood keys. And then it talks about how other um, church leaders have some keys that allow them to do some things, but the prophet's basically the one with all of them. Yeah. Yeah. That, again, like you said, sounds like a bit of a corporate power yeah. structure, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, very corporate. And um, not an idea that's very, um, you know, commonplace within Christian orthodoxy. I mean, it is there. You know, there, there is this idea about keys, but not, not keys of the priesthood. Um, because that's obviously kind of uh, lifting ideas out of the Old Testament and um, applying them to now, um, which is, uh, yeah, not not very common within Orthodox Christian circles. No, no, I think the rest of the the rest of kind of the Christian circles have realised that we've moved on and that Christ came to kind of change some stuff and and that to kind of draw back to the Old Testament is to kind of ignore some of those things, I suppose. Um, yeah. Right. So to the next question. Yeah, go for it. Um, this is where it gets, starts to get personal, Lewis. Uh, the Lord has said that all things are to be done in cleanliness before him. Do you strive for moral cleanliness in your thoughts and behavior? Do you obey the law of chastity? Absolutely, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know. What can I say about this question? Um, so, yeah, I mean, how would you understand done in cleanliness? I guess it's kind of um, a state of mind type thing. You know, you're kind of orientating yourself towards the good, um, mm -hmm. towards towards striving to be pure of heart. 
Um, I guess it's that kind of idea, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, which, you know, I mean, that's a very, it's a very New Testament idea. Jesus does mm -hmm. talk about, um, you know, it's not, um, it's not about thinking. It's about, you know, the sin is in thinking um, that you will commit, you will do certain things. It's not, it's not always um, in, in the actual doing, um, if that I, I didn't word that well, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no, no, I know what you mean. That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's, it's, but uh, what is it in, I believe it's in Matthew, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right, exactly. Um, you know, but but there's a fine line, I think, between between understanding that things generate from our thoughts and become actions to becoming the thought police, um, which Elder Iring seemed to want to become in that same talk we just mentioned earlier when he said, it is a sin to think badly of church leaders it's a sin yeah. you must repent of daily um so i think there's a fine line there to be trod um i, I guess i guess it depends um you know there's obviously people that are approaching these questions will be approaching it in different states of mind mm -hmm. um and there'll be some people that are, are almost kind of going through the motions in a kind of performative uh type way um, you know, which is not to say that they're, you know, cheating on their spouse or, or you know, mm -hmm. or, or, or whatever. Um, but you know, that you're not, you're not examining the purity of every single thought that you have. Yes. But of course, on the other hand, you will get people, um, that are incredibly anxious and trying to, to kind of really live this purity kind of deep within mm -hmm. their heart. Um, and, you know, they must find themselves in um, incredibly, you know, spiritually and emotionally strained places, mm -hmm. um, trying to to reconcile, um, you know, their interior world with um, trying to answer these types of questions mm -hmm. and and present themselves in a, in in the right way within within Mormon spirituality culture, etc. Indeed, because these questions aren't without consequence. You know, what, we're all trying to get this bit of paper. We're all trying to get this bit of paper that says, oh, yeah, you can go to the temple. Uh, you can go and effectively be part of the, the in-group. There's more yeah. to it than that, but it is kind of that, that idea that, you know, if, you, if you're attending the temple, there is, there is social uh, capital to be gained by that yeah. uh, in certain circles. Yeah, because um, you're, you're, you're literally your salvific state Mm -hmm. um is being is held in the balance by this yeah um, because you know you you obviously need the temple recommend mm -hmm. before you can get married and you need to be married uh in order to be sealed yeah. and you need to be sealed in order to to reach the uh highest degree um of heaven so mm -hmm. Yeah, you sure yeah. you're not secretly Mormon, Lewis? Because you're <laughs> understanding this incredibly well. Uh, I've, I've, I'm not sure if people have noticed, but I've thought about it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, we can tell. Uh, we can tell. Okay, so um, there's there's striving for moral cleanliness. That's one of the phrases that they say. Do you strive for cleanliness? So it's interesting that not saying, "Are you clean?" You know, it's "Are you trying to be?" But then they ask yeah. very strictly, "Do you obey the law of chastity?" That's very binary. Are you chaste yes or no yeah. and the law of chastity um from a more perspective kind of from the website is um the law of chastity applies to both men and women it includes strict abstinence from sexual relations before marriage and complete fidelity and loyalty to one spouse after marriage but the thing to remember about these questions um, is that it's not always adult recommends these are asked for. So some of these questions uh, that we'll come to later on are reserved for those that are attending the temple as adults, those that have received their endowments and are attending in that way. Yeah. But children as young as 12, uh, I believe even at 11 now, I may be wrong, but definitely as young as 12 um, are attending the temple. And so children as young as 12 are sitting in an office with a middle-aged man more often than not asking them, are you being sexually pure essentially yeah. what how how do you respond to that Lewis, as an outsider um well i mean those types of uh power dynamics are obviously very concerning mm -hmm. um because these are obviously you know people that have not been trained 
um, in order to to kind of you know approach in a in a therapeutic way uh, these questions with minors. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I think it would it, it's it certainly is concerning because uh, you know it rests so much on on who this individual is. Um, yeah. You know, this individual could be um, an incredibly um, you know intelligent compassionate generous individual um and i'm sh you know of course that would be that of course that person is out there asking these questions but at the same time um you know this person um could also be um a very manipulative person um that is uh trying to acquire power and status for themselves and you know therefore the well-being of the person in front of them may not be their highest priority. Mm. Um, so it's just, it is very concerning. It's, it's big red flag kind of to me. And there are other people that have been concerned about it. The movement of Sam Young to try and you know, increase the protection of children, things like that, ultimately ended in his excommunication. But the church has made some moves. But it just saddens me every time I see a newspaper article coming out of, particularly out of Utah and Idaho, saying this bishop has been called upon these charges uh etc yeah. etc et it just it breaks my heart every single time that yeah that we're still in this position and i think the temple recommended interview is honestly one of those places where some of these things start and some of these problems arise and so it's worth uh, critiquing and looking at yeah yeah it's a difficult it's a difficult problem um because of course you know if you are 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 working as a um a counselor or a therapist you probably um, depending on where you live, depending on what state you are or what country you're in, will require some kind of uh, licensing or to be part of some kind of um, body that requires you to have um, met certain um, requirements. But of course, to be the leader within a conservative religious organization rarely, if ever, requires any such um, you know, standards to be met. Um, Someone online, I think, put it beautifully. Um, they, they said that it's not that those in religious organizations are all pedophiles and child molesters right. um, and abusive. It's that religious organizations can create an environment in which those people can fr thrive. Um, yeah. And I think, I think we, we see that this, this situation where uh, a man who did have those tendencies um, is in a position with a child, you know, that's it's, you're creating an environment in which that could happen. Yeah. Um, on that cheery note, uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, and this this is where we're starting to really kind of dig down into, are you being a good Mormon? Uh, it says, do you follow the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ in your private and public behavior with members of your family and others? Yeah, so um, that would obviously require you to know in a huge amount of detail what those teachings are. Mm -hmm. um, which you know it's going to be difficult because in anybody's spiritual life when they are um you know journeying through a religion there's obviously um a process in which you're you're coming to to learn what those teachings are you're coming to learn what is expected of you um and it's obviously wildly open to interpretation um you know one person may be able to pull um, a, a very particular sentence by a very particular president once upon a time, a particular prophet of the church, and say, ah, but you have not done this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, it's definitely open to, um, to misuse, I, I, mm -hmm. I would imagine. I think it's also open to interpretation by the person being asked, because I yeah. can say, uh, you know, I do follow the teachings of the church in my private and public behavior with members of my family uh, and other people. I can just cherry pick which teachings those are, right? Yeah, yeah. because <laughs> um, uh, you obviously get, you know, there are um, uh, Mormons that, that think in terms of, um, well, I follow uh, the teachings as they were presented by Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. um and you know i don't recognize you know what came later yeah um you know and obviously you know the mormon church has splintered off into its various denominations and there are the various um groups uh within within the mormon church as well that are putting yeah. the emphasis in in different places for sure okay so 
I reckon you'd pass that one. <laughs> uh, so then, and then the next question kind of leads on from it. Um, and they're really, again, trying to dig down into what it is you do in your life. Do you support or promote any teachings, practices, or doctrine contrary to those of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Are you loyal? Yeah. Well, again, it's it's hugely open to, to yeah. interpretation, what that means. Um, you know, like, I don't know, how you're spending your time. Like, if I am going to the cinema and mm -hmm. I am, uh, you know, watching a movie which is oh, a bit racy, it's an 18, you know, is that not me maybe kind of contravening, um, you know, something which is uh, the in the best uh, spirit and, and practice of the, of the church? So, you know, it would just, you could really just, I don't know, kind of put yourself into a position of really, really beating yourself up mm. and constantly questioning everything you're doing, every, you know, how you're you're living your life in 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 kind of fear that you're not meeting the required standard um, of the church, of God, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I totally agree, and it, it makes me wonder whether this question is designed to do that, whether it's designed to kind of make you think, to make you nitpick, to make you go, oh, is there anything? Do I support any teachings, any uh, practices, or did I? Oh, was I was I supportive of of someone's uh, run the other day? I, did I give money to their five k, and they were actually running for an LGBT charity, and so therefore I've actually supported something that's contrary to the church. You know, you you could get into that minutia if I mean, some people would just brush it off and say, "Well, no, I don't attend uh, you know, Wicca uh, seances, and so I'm fine, yeah. or I'm I'm not sacrificing goats, so it's all good." But some people will nitpick to the nth degree about what they're doing and and really beat themselves up. And I wonder whether this is this is there to kind of keep people in check. Yeah, and I, I think it. You know, again, it depends who is asking these questions and how they're answering them. Uh, because mm. again, I'm I'm sure that there are um, some people asking these questions that that really want to give you the temple recommend, mm -hmm. and they really just want to hear the the most simple and straightforward response to you, just so they can can tick the box. Yes, and and give you what what they want to give you anyway, because they don't mm -hmm. want to. Um, create a problem for you or for themselves they don't want it to become a big thing so that is one category of people but mm -hmm. also i can imagine you know someone that's like well really you've never done anything like and you know to kind of why yeah. don't we just sit with that question for a moment and let's just think about it and reflect mm -hmm. on it you know let's bring that question to god or you know whatever how, however yeah. you're going to put that so yeah I think, and a, and a common thing that bishops will say to you is that um, you can say whatever you want to me. The Lord knows whether you're telling the truth. Yeah, yeah. I've had that said to me multiple. I know of other people that have had that said to them multiple times. It's it's a it's a thing of well, it doesn't really matter what you say to me. The Lord knows, and it's kind of like well, you know, the thought police are in your head, and yeah. so they know. You know, God knows the the intent of your heart, uh, and so you then kind of feel like you've got nowhere to hide. <laughs> yeah. So again, it just depends on what spirit that's done. Um, because that kind of, that's not unique to Mormonism, of course, you know, that of kind course. of, that kind of um, spiritual um, religiosity could, you know, which could be very manipulative mm -hmm. um, or it could be meant in, in the best possible sense. And yeah. so, you know, it really depends on the heart of the Bishop that's, that's asking you these things, I think. Indeed. I, I would agree. Um, so another question uh, for you, the next question about uh, what you do and don't do. Uh, we're starting to get quite prescriptive now. Uh, we're starting to get very much, can I tick a box, yes or no? So do you strive to keep the Sabbath day holy, both at home and at church, attend your meetings, prepare for and worthily partake of the sacrament, and live your life in harmony with the laws and commandments of the gospel? Yeah, so there's a lot in that. It's a list. There's a, it's a yes. list of things there, mm -hmm. and um, you know, of course, all of these are are understood in very explicitly Mormon set, it, you know, terms. Um, because you know what keeping the Sabbath holy might mean to a Orthodox Christian could be very different to what 
this question is actually asking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, worthily partake of the sacrament. I assume that um, the sacrament is taken every Sunday. Yes. Would I be right in thinking that? Yeah. yeah because absolutely. of course, that's not that is not necessarily the case within all Christian denominations. Okay. Um, so, so you know, again, it's just the sense in which this is understood within within Mormon circles. Mm -hmm. um, live your life in harmony with the laws and commandments of the gospel. Um, and of yeah. course, that is again understood in very Mormon terms because yeah. when Orthodox Christians talk about the gospel, they have something very different in mind. Indeed. Um, Mormons and, are very much talking about the gospel as restored by Joseph Smith, including the right. Book of Mormon and its things. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the, the odd thing is, is in the, in the way that the question is framed, you know, do you want to keep the Sabbath day holy? Do you want to take the sacrament? You know, do you want to uphold the gospel? There's nothing there, really, that an Orthodox Christian wouldn't be like, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't I want to uphold all those things? But of course, they're all meant in very um, explicit terms. So when mm -hmm. it does say, I'll just ask a clarification question then. Mm -hmm. When it does say, keep the Sabbath day holy, how would you understand that coming from a Mormon perspective? Uh, depends what family you grew up in. Um one you know, Mormons uh, are very strict in not spending money on the Sabbath, so not buying anything. That's part right. of keeping the Sabbath day holy. Um, you uh, generally don't watch a lot of households don't watch television um, on a Sunday. They they tend to do things that you wouldn't do the rest of the week. Um, it's meant to be a very different day to the rest of the week. It's meant to be um, sanctified in that sense to yeah. uh, things of God. However, the church has become a lot less prescriptive about what you do and don't do on the the Sabbath. There used to be uh, articles in the in the children's magazine about my dad wanted to pull over and get us some food because we were really hungry, and I sat in the back and crossed my arms and frowned at him and said, "No, Dad, that's not what Jesus would do." And we didn't go and get a burger, and we went home, and it was all fine. Yeah. Those were stories I was told as a kid. Um, but now it's very much like, well, does it bring the spirit? Does it does it uh, invite those feelings of harmony and peace uh, with the gospel and what what is um, you know what is a, a good way of living and things like that? So it's become a bit more relaxed, and I think particularly with the church reducing its hours uh, of service from three hours to two hours on a Sunday, um, because Mormon church lasts three hours uh, or it used yeah. to, um, they are trying to make church more home centered. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how we come out of COVID actually uh, in kind of a church centered, uh, in a home centered church sort of environment. Um, so that's what that means to Mormons, if that's helped clarify that for you. Yeah. So, you know, for example, would it be possible to not go to church and still keep the Sabbath day holy? Um, because, you know, you well, could, see, it you says could... attend your meetings here. So, yeah. yeah. But you could, you could, all you could think of scenarios in which, um, it wasn't practical to go mm. to church, you know, yeah. a, like, you know, just think of a really extreme example, like, you know, your loved one is dying, for example, you know, do I feel, ob do I still feel obligated to go to church? Um, even though, you know, I have t entirely legitimate pulls on my time mm. in other directions. And, you know, where do you draw that line? Um, cause you can obviously yeah. be very authoritarian and descriptive mm. and overbearing with that kind of stuff. Um, or you could allow the individual to kind of discern for themselves what's appropriate. Well, if I tell you that in most wards, there's someone that takes sacrament meeting attendance and kind of marks down who is there and who's not there. And if someone's not there for, I believe it's about four or six weeks, if they're not there for that long in a row, someone is assigned to reach out to them and find mm -hmm. out if they're okay, what they're doing. It can be seen as a very nice thing, you know, checking that someone's okay. But in reality, yeah. if someone's got friends at church, if they're missing one week, people might say, is everything all right? Um, yeah. or people would know what's going on and they'd say to the bishop you know right uh, this person's spouse is dying so don't expect them to see him at church anytime soon they've got more important things going on right now such as sorting things out and their finances and whatnot so really yeah. it seems more a control thing and a, and a statistical analysis to have someone yeah. taking numbers taking role every week yeah, I yeah. suppose, you know, once again, it just comes down to the spirit in which something is being done. Mm -hmm. You could imagine someone having that job that that has a, a very um, um, compassionate and, and, and loving attitude towards others and, you know, want to reach out um, yeah. when, when people 
have not turned up. But you can also imagine um, the very negative extreme as well. Absolutely. Um, here's a really straight up question for you. The next one. Do you strive to be honest in all that you do? Yeah. So, you know, so a unbelievably broad, yes. um, you know, like yeah. what, like, I mean, you could just apply this to anything. Like what if I'm playing a board game with someone? Am I not allowed to be deceptive? Well, according to the question, uh, yeah. I don't like to be. But yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it used to say, I believe it used to say, um, are you honest in your dealings with your fellow men? I believe that was the the previous wording, right? Which made it a bit more about your transactions and your interactions, and it was just generally, you know, are you are you dealing in good faith with people? I yeah. suppose. Um, Gender was interesting. As well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's now become inclusive. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that gets me is, uh, I can't remember which apostle said it. Someone can let me know in the comments. Uh, but someone said of the church and its leadership, we are as honest as we know how to be. Yeah. Now that, why do they not know how to be completely honest? If they're yeah. asking members to strive to be honest in all that they do, how can the leadership of the church say, uh, we're as honest as we know how to be? What yeah. are your, what's your take on that? Well, you know, from reading quite a few things about the church, I'm very aware of the fact that they are unbelievably economical with the truth. <laughs> um, you know, they obviously want themselves to be presented in the best possible light. And mm -hmm. they are more than happy to, to, you know, bend the truth, you know, beyond recognition in order mm -hmm. to, to achieve that. Um, so, again, it really does come down to this dichotomy between um you know to what extent are you um is this kind of performative for you um like you know should you be honest yes mm -hmm. sure of course of course i yeah. strive to be honest mm -hmm. um but uh again you know am i willing as an individual to sometimes be dishonest if it's in the best interest of the church you know, yeah. is that should that is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, it's that's complicated, isn't it? it really yeah, lying for the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, there are obviously there's obviously a sense to the lying of the Lord thing in which mm -hmm. that is always going to be bad, right? That's yes. the way that's usually framed, is that's always a negative. Mm -hmm. But you can under you you to, to to kind of play devil's advocate a little bit, I can imagine um situations in which being economical with the truth can be the most loving mm -hmm. approach that you can take to someone um so yeah I, it's obviously complicated but you know the, it yeah. doesn't seem like the church does a very good job out of being honest either so it's no uh, so. definitely not and and so the, the caveat there strive i feel like is almost as much of a get out of jail free card for the leaders of the church as it is for the person answering the question absolutely yeah um, definitely but they have no caveats about the next question. Are you a full tithe payer? I am not a full tithe payer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go into that, Lewis. So the tithe question is, 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 is an interesting one. I think within, you know, conservative evangelicalism, for example, we'll just, we'll pick on evangelicalism. Uh, within America, right? Because there's a very there's a very cultural difference between evangelicalism in America versus here. But in America, conservative evangelicalism, there is this expectation that you will pay the tithe, um, and it's kind of done on principle. Um, yeah. It's not done on the basis of, well, how is that money being used, right? Because you're kind of giving it over to to God. Mm -hmm. um so yeah do you have any yeah i mean uh the church does the same thing there's a caveat at the bottom of its um of its donation slips uh that says uh although we will seek to use these donations uh in the way that we've effectively told you um they do become the property of the church to do with as we see fit to further benefit the mission of the church i've butchered that wording but um that's essentially what it says uh, some people view tithing, particularly the fact that it's in the interview to get hold of one of these, um, yeah. as pay to play. Uh, it's this idea that if you give the correct amount of money, a full tithe, you don't yeah. strive, you do it. Is it 
is it financially the right amount of money you should have paid? That is the question. And if you have given a tenth of your income to the church, you get your golden ticket to go and be saved, to go and enter into the temple, to make the covenants that allow you to go and live with God. And so there's there's that, that it it is, I feel like it has no place in this interview personally. Yeah. I feel like the the fact that you pay you pay money to the church to support the church should not affect the church's inclination to allow you to access the um the the ordinances of salvation your access to salvation should not be dependent on the money you give the church uh so it it feels and it wasn't always um in the temple recommend interview questions we have to bear that in mind okay. it came in 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 the kind of um believe the early 1900s it made its way in um i guess uh, sorry i just i, I guess yeah, yeah. i just feel i don't know i i'm slightly conflicted on the question mm -hmm. um because on one level there is a kind of there's a principle to it yeah um that you know if you are a a faithful mormon a faithful enough mormon that mm -hmm. you are going to be a temple recommend holder then is it not reasonable for the church to ask you to uphold that principle. Now, of course, at the same time, you can obviously point to the fact that, um, well, is that money being used justly? Mm -hmm. You know, yes. But the, the church is really, really wealthy. So, you know, why should we be giving the, yes. this this really, really rich organization money? Mm -hmm. You know, but at the same time, you know, I can't, for example, choose not to pay my taxes because I disagree with the government. Right, yes. I I have an obligation um, to to continue to pay um, my taxes, and if I again, if I think about a kind of conservative evangelical setting in America, um, you know, I think it would be a cause for concern if an if a member just outright refused mm -hmm. to to pay. Um, but of course, it gets complicated because literally, again, one salvific state is at play. Uh, as you said, pay to play. Mm -hmm. So I, I can kind of see it from from both points of view. Um, it both in on on one level seems reasonable, um, and on another level, obviously, you know, there's questions around. Well, mm -hmm. why does the church even need to be asking this of its members? But you know, if it is a commandment of the church, which it is, it's in the Book of Mormon. It is mm -hmm. asked of its members. Then why would that not you know why would that not be expected of you so i yeah. don't know it it feels like it, it doesn't feel that unreasonable to me i, I think mm. so i i totally get where you're coming from and were the church not sitting on a hundred billion dollars yeah and had the church not made the promise in 1913 that we will see a day when we will not have to ask donations from you but that which you freely give then I would feel in a similar way. But I feel like you can't say people are freely giving this tithe when their eternal salvation is resting on paying that money. For, for, for me, it's the fact that it's tied into your ability to access those ordinances. It's not that it's a point of concern for the church. Of course it would be. It would be, it would be a point of concern for the church if the members weren't willing to keep any commandment. Yeah. But I'm not sure this commandment warrants effectively cutting people off from the ordinances of salvation that's just that's just my my point on that one i suppose uh, yeah i just to push back slightly i suppose Go for it. that i suppose that um it's not on one level it's not really your salvific state um in the balance because of course you know if you're not living you know exactly to the precepts of mormonism then in theory that will mean you just enter into the second tier of heaven, right? So, well, so you, are, you are freely yeah. choosing not to uphold the restored church, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to outer darkness. No, but then equally, if you were to, uh, I mean, I feel like we can get into a really long debate about this, but if you were yeah. to, um, if you were to look at it, that if someone never paid their tithing because they felt it was immoral to do so because of the way the church uses it to invest in property and, and such, then 
you would find someone that was never able to go to the temple and enter into the new and everlasting covenant, the covenant which is necessary to enter into the celestial kingdom. The things found within the endowment are the, the signs, tokens, and keywords necessary to pass the angels that stand as sentinels and enter into the presence of God. That's Brigham Young said that. Uh, so your your ability to to enter the celestial kingdom, I'm not sure tithing is the show of fidelity to God that we make it out to be sometimes because yeah. I feel like the scriptures make a very good point of explaining that God doesn't need our money. He needs us to show our willing to part with it in order to benefit others. Now, if members were told that they could pay their money to local charity instead or donate a tenth of their time, a tenth of of, of other things other than money, because once it becomes so fixedly about money, I think you end up falling into the teachings of Christ where he actually teaches that, you know, where it's, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter to heaven because you've got that focus on money too much. If you could pay a tithe of, of your time, like I said, or uh, of, of other things, then you would be showing that same commitment to God. You would be showing that same willingness to give up yeah. without it being about the money. And it wouldn't matter whose balance sheet it goes on. Yeah. But I, but I suppose that all can also kind of work both ways because the whole mm -hmm. kind of the whole kind of render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's type idea mm -hmm. um, is in a way a kind of um, renouncing of, of of money's importance, yes. um, and and in in that sense, you know, why get so why get so kind of het up um, on the ten percent you're supposed to be giving because mm -hmm. ultimately, um, you know, the graces of God. Um, the truth of the church, etc. All those things trump any material, yeah. Um, you know things that we can own in this, in the span of this mortal life. Um, well, I say we get together and and do another chat, particularly about the concept of tithing. Um, sure. And let's move on to the next question, if you don't mind. Uh, so, do you understand and obey the word of wisdom? That my question would be, does anyone understand <laughs> the word of wisdom? <laughs> no, because you have people in the summers in Utah hosting barbecues where copious amounts of red meat are consumed, right. um, which is not a appropriate according to the word of wisdom, but that seems to just fly. That's fine. But yeah. you touch coffee and Lewis, you're in trouble, mate. <laughs> Go on. I, I, I mean... Word of wisdom is obviously incredibly, in a way, very complicated as a subject because there's the way the word of wisdom is understood today mm -hmm. um, by the uh, authorities of the church. And there's then the way that Joseph Smith intended it. And mm. those two things seem to be uh, yes. in conflict. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of classic one is that, you know, it seems to me that, um, you know, low alcohol wheat beer is essentially mm -hmm. recommended uh, by the word of wisdom um, in yes. order to avoid, um, you know, people getting um, kind of swept up into uh, rampant alcoholism, mm -hmm. um, you know, hard liquor and, and all that kind of, all that kind of thing. But then this is obviously, you know, plays into um, prohibition mm -hmm. and the way prohibition affected um, the way the word of wisdom was applied yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. because it, it, it didn't become on the radar of the temple recommend until the 1920s apologies earlier um that was the the recommend question i was thinking of that didn't come into the 1900s i don't know much more about tithing um but certainly on the word of wisdom that came in around prohibition time they were really kind of holding members to it because joseph smith drank the the day or the night before he died yeah you know um brigham young i believe had a bar in utah uh, at some point, you know, there's it's it's one it's one of these things where it was given. I believe it says in scripture, it's given not by commandment, but by way of, but but by word of wisdom. Um, and so, yeah. it was clearly not an authoritative and declarative statement of "thou shalt" and "thou shalt not." And if it was, most members of the church would be failing because of the copious amounts of red meat we consume. For yeah, the last part. yeah. And I think I mentioned this in in one of. Um, my videos, but there's a there's a there's a um, an example of a of a time that Joseph Smith gave a sermon condemning mm -hmm. smoking, and then yeah. was you know seen about town like just later that afternoon smoking a large cigar. So you know <laughs> the the conflicts within yeah. um, 
you know, with uh, Joseph Smith and with Brigham Young, you know, are, you know, huge. Yeah. You know. But again, it's, this is a very, a very, um, a very hard line. Are you doing this? Yes or no? There's yeah. that. There's that conference talk where that lady starts crying about that one cup of coffee. Yeah, that, that cup of coffee this woman drank kept her from entering the temple and being sealed to her children, or whatever the instance was. And you have to ask yourself, you know, should it be that big a deal? Yeah. When you consider all the other things that Christ has asked of us, and all the other things that come with being a Christian and a follower of Christ, is tea and coffee particularly is it that big a deal is it is it yeah what what, yeah. what are your thoughts from a from a more general christian perspective yeah i mean yeah there's obviously far greater sins you know why are you going to get why are you going to get so um fixated on this you know mm -hmm. you know because what what isn't in the temple recommended few questions is are you a murderer yeah. yeah have you raped and assaulted anyone none of these questions are in there yeah but uh, uh, you know, I mean, there is questions about chastity, um, but you know, there's no the, the the rules. They seem to want to know whether you've broken or not. Seem to be quite interesting. That it's around: Are you paying all the money you're meant to, and are you eating and drinking what we tell you you can? Yeah, I mean, they're very tied into Mormon identity. You know, yes, they're they're very tied into um, the things that differentiate Mormons. That's from, a very good point. from Christians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anything which is kind of you know, in, in the realm of 10 commandments uh, isn't mentioned. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that's a very good point. It seems to be, these are the things that it's like, are it's not like, are you living a Christian life? Are you Mormon? That's what this is. This is really kind of asking, are you, right. are you living the Mormon life? I think that's, yeah. that's a good point. It's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and now for a completely random question, um, this one, has always boggled my brain and uh, let us know in the comments if you understand why this is in the temple recommend interview. Um, do you have any financial or other obligations to a former spouse or to children? If yes, are you current in meeting those obligations? Yeah. Yeah. It's really weird. It, it, it doesn't, yeah. I, I can only imagine that it, that it must be linked in some way to the tithing. You know, the church hmm. is obviously deeply concerned with your money. <laughs> uh, the church wants to know where your money is going right yes i assume um you know that they may even go to the extent of 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 wanting you to prove that you are paying your tithe by actually showing pay slips i don't know if they take it to that extreme well so they do have what they call a tithing settlement um meeting at the end of each year where they effectively show you the tithes you've paid and ask you to make a declaration that that is a full and honest tithe so right. they ask you to say that is the amount of money i should have paid or or no there's something missing um so there is that sort of thing but i don't personally i've never been asked to show a pay slip and okay. then therefore they can work out what 10 percent is um i know of other people that have been asked to give certain amounts in tithing because people know what they earn but i don't think that's church policy okay um, yeah, and so, you know, I, I imagine that, I don't know, there was some scandal at some point that, you know, I guess this gets around the, you know, being able to cover over mm. whether you've had um, marriages before, whether you've had children before, you know, how messy, how messy is your, um, are your affairs, you know, are your mm -hmm. affairs in order? Um, and this kind of is a way of... Um, you know, making sure that uh, the person being questioned is uh, not being able to cover things over, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, is it? I wonder, is it tied into that very Mormon thing? Like you were saying, if these questions are all about how strong is your Mormon identity, it could be, are you supporting your family? Are yeah. you being a good Mormon family person? Um, yeah. You know, are you, are you, in that sense, are you still looking after your family regardless of your relation to them? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so, yeah. go on, go on, go on. No, no, sorry. Yeah, carry on. I was just going to ask you the next question, but yeah, if you've go got for it. Else, yeah. Okay, okay, that's fine. So this one particularly pertinent to you, Lewis. Do you keep the covenants that you made in the temple, including wearing the temple garment as instructed in the endowment? I I don't, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm sure there's a black market for them somewhere if you yeah. want to get hold of some. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it, this is the other thing is that um, in the temple, you are instructed to wear your garments throughout your life, right? Yeah. That's, those, those are the words. 
there seems to be this idea that you should wear your garments night and day. And that was in the Temple Recommend interview questions before, but it's been taken out now. Yes. That you don't have to wear them night and day because the instruction in the temple is that you wear them throughout your life. So it is then really up to the individual um, how kind of much they are wearing them and, and, and to what extent they feel like they are wearing them as they should. Um, but you can't buy them without one of these, yes. uh, which means that you need a current one to get more. So the church has a monopoly over effectively your underwear. It has a monopoly over the clothing that you need. Yeah, And in order to be able to get more, you must remain worthy. Yeah, In order to be able to keep the covenant that you made, you must continue to pay the church money. You must continue to follow the dictates of what you can and can't eat, etc. What do you make of that? Um, I suppose it's not a question I've really thought that much about mm. because uh, it's obviously one that I can't really speak to directly because I have no personal experience with mm -hmm. ever owning or wearing garments. Um, I think there's a lot of, or I understand that there's a lot of Mormons that it almost, you know, there's this kind of status thing, you know, in mm -hmm. play, you know, the extent to which, oh, I'm a Mormon that would even wear my temple garments when I'm working out. I'm a Mormon that would even wear my temple garments when I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you do get the kind of extremes which are like, I don't even take my temple garments off when I'm making love to my wife. Or, you know, you get this, yeah. you get that kind of um, extreme um, level. And and it's like, to what extent are you, uh, are you a, a holy Mormon that, that, mm -hmm. that wears it most of the time? Or are you a really holy Mormon that never takes them off no matter what? Um, and I definitely think you can kind of one up each other uh, yes. and play that game. Um, mm. of trying to make yourself come across as uh, holier than thou when it comes mm. to when it comes to the wearing I've, of garments. I've always wondered why garments have such like strong and visible hemlines, considering they're something that we're meant to keep sacred and keep covered and keep you know out of public view. We talk about how we keep our devotions on the inside and we wear them under our clothes. They're an inner expression, etc., of, of our commitment to God. They have some pretty beefy hemlines, and and yeah. you find, particularly in Mormon dating culture, there's this uh, thing where you go up and you rub someone's arm, and you're feeling for their their garment line, or right. you put your hand on their thigh, and you're feeling for a garment line. You garment check people. Um, yeah, you, know. you see that you see it all the time. It's yeah. like you know, you and I have obviously both done videos uh, reacting to Saints Unscripted content, mm -hmm. and you yep. can see the presenters on Saints Unscripted. You see their garments poking out all yeah. the time. Like yeah. so, you know, it's hardly some. It's a um, subtle Mormon flex. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's always there. It's always present. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, so garments, uh, they, I guess they carry a lot of social capital as well. Yeah. Um, I have, I've just spotted someone in the comments saying that you don't necessarily need to recommend to buy them once you've been endowed. I can't speak to that, but um, I'd be really interested in reading more about that in the comments and looking into that further. Um, okay. I have two more questions for you, Lewis. How are you right, feeling? Okay. Fine. Good, good. Good, good. good, good. Right. So, uh, am I, I'm going to get in, I'm going to get the temple recommend <laughs> with, what I've, with what I've said so far. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll let you know at the end. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so are there serious sins in your life that need to be resolved with priesthood authorities as part of your repentance? What a loaded question. The floor yeah. is yours. So I suppose I would just want further clarification on, on what that even entails. Okay. Um, what what kind of sin would I have committed that requires um, it being resolved with with priesthood authority? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so there are there are certain things uh, within the LDS Church that require kind of priesthood authority and repentance. Um, I don't have time to kind of dig it up right now, but if you look in the Church Handbook of Instructions, um, particularly a, a lot of a lot of sins that are also crimes. Um, okay. that a lot of sins that require church membership councils, things, although particularly apostasy is a, is a notable one. Um, you know, things like uh, breaking the law of chastity is one that you kind of have to confess to a bishop and things like that. So you imagine the issue with, you know, every young man ever has had to go to his bishop at some point and say, Bishop, I'm masturbating. I need to confess this to you. I yeah. mean, really unhealthy, difficult situation to put, you know, young people. Uh, underage children in with a middle-aged man to kind of confess and whatnot. Yeah. I'd be interesting. Really I'd be interested to know to what it, you know, to how much that happens. Mm. Obviously, um, you know, 
every man that's ever been born has masturbated. But <laughs> but but I can't imagine every single man or every single boy is going to their bishop to talk about this. There must again, this must there must be a kind of performative versus um mm. uh versus you know very guilty conscience kind of uh yeah. interplay that, that must happen with that there must be some men that are able to compartmentalize in such a way that, mm -hmm. they, that it just never comes up they would yeah. never discuss it with their bishop and they're able to just uh you know square that circle in their own mind and then there must be other people that are not leaving their bishop alone and are constantly <laughs> trying to trying to resolve yeah. this issue with them um yeah. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I was, I was, I was in a middle ground. You know, I, I told my bishop, and I, I was really guilty and upset and horrified at my heathenous, horrible actions um, yeah. in self-regulating my own sexuality. Uh, that you know, I had to go tell this man. Um, and so yeah, I mean, it does happen. But then equally, like you said, there are there are youth that I think I feel like it. it sometimes it can it can depend on how how much you believe that god already knows and so your bishop probably kind of knows already yeah um and how how into it you are you know i knew people particularly growing up as a mormon in the uk you come across a wider i suppose a wider spectrum of members but maybe i'm wrong i knew members who were you know having sex out you know outside of marriage and things like that they weren't keeping the the law of chastity um but they never got mentioned to their bishop yeah you know um because they didn't feel like it needed to because they didn't take that part seriously and so i suppose it just depends which parts you take you take seriously i guess yeah um but other serious things like that. yeah yeah i mean that's just the weird thing about that basically applies to all of these questions mm -hmm. you know it's to what extent you're able to kind of justify subjectively to yourself mm. that you are you know am i for following this well if i'm really yep. honest with myself not really but mm -hmm. Am I trying to live in a yeah. in, in an upright way? If I believe that I am, then I might be able to answer yes to a question yeah. which is strictly no. So, yes. so yeah, yeah, you know. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and the funny thing about this question is, you're saying that need to be resolved with priesthood authorities as part of your repentance. Those priesthood authorities are the people sat across the table from you. Right. Yeah. Right. Those, those priests and authorities are the people that are op opposite the table. So they're basically saying, so is there anything you need to tell me? Yes. Anything I should be aware of? Yes. That's essentially what they're doing. Uh, yeah. which, I mean, it's super uncomfortable <laughs> because it, it and, and you've just answered the question saying, yes, I'm honest. So you've, 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 you've got to this point in the interview and you've gone, right, well, I'm, I'm cracking with this, 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 and this, and this. Oh, but is there something going wrong in my life? Right. Okay. Does that need to be resolved? Ah, okay. And it's the second to last question. So, I mean, you, you, you've you laid the landscape for your righteousness and how you are getting on in your Mormon identity, how much, how, how good a life are you living, all that sort of stuff. And he's yeah. like, yeah, just twisting the thumbscrews a bit. Yeah, but is there anything I need to know about? Yeah. That's kind of how I, I view it slightly. Yeah, I suppose, you know, it also depends if the bishop is trying to catch you out or not. You know, does, mm. do, does the bishop have... Uh, some kind of problem with you and you know therefore they obviously have all the power to um to to cause the problem yeah right because there's there's one way of asking that question we are like um are there any sins that need to be resolved no no okay good right let's move on <laughs> uh, and then there's another way of asking that where you're like you know well you know come on yeah. are you saying you've not done anything oh come on come on you know and you yeah know, so it, Again, it you know the spirit in which these questions are being asked. Again, hugely important. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know of I know of instances personally where people have not been allowed to uh, take temple recommended interviews because their bishop knows of something that's gone on in their life and has said, "I don't think you'll be able to answer the questions." Right. Yeah. Now, I don't think that's right because this these questions are ultimately between this person and God. That's what we always keep getting told. Um, and it is up to this per it's up to this person to decide, I suppose, because like you said, they're also subjective, whether they feel yes or no to these these things. And so they should always have the chance to kind of say that um to the 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 bishop or the state president, um, because these this interview is asked twice over. Yeah. Um, you know, when you get to the end of this, you're then gonna have to do it again with a stake leader, so someone at a at a higher level. Um so that's that's what sticks out to me really. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Final question. Here we go. There we go. Final question. Do you consider yourself worthy to enter the Lord's house and participate in temple ordinances? Yeah. Drop. So, so <laughs> to kind of catch your final question. Yeah. It'd be funny, you know, someone gets through all of these and it's yeah. all fine all the way through. And then right then they're like, yeah. no, no, oh, no, obviously not. <laughs> Not me. I'm not worthy. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It's not why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I think it's, it's it's interesting that all the pressure comes at the end on the individual. Yeah. This bishop is set up as a, a they're called a judge in Israel. They're set up as as someone that can that can judge and guide and and they're the gatekeeper. But the gatekeeper then turns around and goes, "Well, do you want to come in?" Essentially, the gatekeeper goes, well, yeah, I've asked, I've put you in this difficult situation. I've asked yeah. you all these uncomfortable questions about your chastity, about your financial circumstances, about what you eat and drink. I've asked you all this, but do you think that you're okay? Yeah. Kind because of like, we have found you worthy if you've said yes to all this, but do mm -hmm. you find yourself worthy? Yeah. And, and it's a weird move for for a, you know, a Christian religion to make because you know in a way it's kind of um the belief in in god that makes you worthy so it's like mm. it's like the religion itself which kind of um infers worthiness upon you um whereas this final question requires you to declare your own worthiness you know declare that you um are have a status you know high enough to be able to walk with the gods effectively mm. yeah it, it it it's it's kind of like are you are, are you ready to accept that you you can be at this level are you are, are you ready for this um i think it's interesting then if you look at the back of the the temple recommends if i if i hold this up to the camera real quick you uh, and there's the state presidents. So what's interesting is I have to sign it as well. I have to almost sign and declare. I was always told by one bishop, my signature is the most important one. Right. Which again is a, a completely like mind bender. It's like, well, then what are you doing here? Hmm. Like, not, not, not in blood though. So that no, 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 in ink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's it's this idea that well, if I can self certify, why do I need to come to these interviews? Yeah. You know, yeah. why can't the bishop just bring me in and say, right, so um, I trust that you've taken a time to introspect on the values that we expect you to hold as a member of the church. And uh, do you find yourself to keep those values and do you find yourself worthy to enter the temple? This question it, raises to me the need of the interview at all. Go on. Yeah. Is that a thing, though? I, I've heard for in some I've heard from somewhere that it is possible to be given an indefinite temple recommend. Like, uh for yeah. for presidents or for people that are very high up within the yeah. church do they do they have to go through this or are they eventually given the kind of the golden temple pass so uh speaking um purely anecdotally here um yeah. when i served my mission at the temple uh the temple president at the time uh was an emeritus uh general authority 70 so he'd sat on the stand at conference he'd made it pretty high up in the church and what would happen is he would have his temple recommend sent out to him, to yeah. him just to sign. So he didn't have to go through an interview. It was just right. sent to him. That's what I, I, as far as I was aware, that's what was going on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can get to a point where you don't need to grovel to the bishop and say, yeah, I promise I haven't been having sex with anyone but my wife. I promise I've been paying all the money I need to, all this sort of stuff. Which it's like, an, it's like an even higher tier within heaven. Yeah, it's like, right, you've got a gold ticket that just never expires. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's kind of, it reminds me of the second anointing in a lot of ways, that idea that, you know, you get the second anointing and then boom, that's it. Unless you kill someone. Uh, yeah. And even then you're handed over to Satan's power for a while and then you get to the celestial kingdom anyway. So, yeah. I mean, there seems to be that idea that once you've made it high enough up in the church, then all of a sudden, you know, there's a bit of a carte blanche to, to, to you know, just get on with life. Yeah. yeah. Without sort of the rules and regimens getting in the way. Which makes me wonder why those why us us lowly members need these rules and regs as well. Yeah, yeah, haven't reached the the highest echelons yet, but you know maybe one day. <laughs> mm. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> well, Lewis, now is the fateful result. Have you earned a temple recommend? Well, 
I mean, you don't pay your tithing, so no. Oh, damn. <laughs> damn. That's the, that's the <laughs> is you, you haven't given us the money, you have not paid, therefore you cannot play. Um, thank you I very much well. <laughs> for, yeah. for doing this, um, for being willing to sit down and answer these questions. Um, and thanks to everyone that stayed around to watch. I mean, we've got about 67 people watching now. We've had about 70 or so throughout. So it's nice to have you all here with us. Lewis, is there anything final you want to say about the Temple Recommend interview, how we've, having now had one, essentially? Uh, no, not really. It was just really good to uh, come on here with you. You know, hopefully this is the uh, the start of uh, of more live chats to uh, to come. I'm sure we've got a lot more to yeah. uh, talk about. Getting the, the British perspective on uh, Mormonism uh, out there. Uh, yes. So, yep, definitely a big thumbs up for me. And uh, I look forward to many more. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Lewis. Uh, I'm just going to remind everyone quickly where you can be found. You're at Numinosophy Academy. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'll put a link to that in the description. I'm going to be found next at Sunstone. Uh, I'm speaking there at 1.30 British time this Saturday. There'll be a link to that in the description. Uh, thank you very much from me. And uh, I'm sure Lewis will say thank you to you too. Yeah. And thank you very much from me. Cheers, oh, everyone. No Bye now. <laughs>